We love you all, and any Utah fans here, you're about to lose tonight. Go Spurs, go! Okay. All right, that is the wrong Texas, uh, our wrong SX Open, I should say. So let's just get right here live at the Valero Texas Open, everybody. Good evening and welcome live to TPC San Antonio at the JW Marriott, where the first round of the Valero Texas Open is slowly winding down. At last check, there were 33 golfers under par. Not too bad when you consider how heavy this wind has been. So the fog lifted, but the weather conditions are still less than stellar as the golfers have been dealing with heavy winds and sporadic rain showers all day long. Matt Kuchar on 18, which was his ninth hole of the day. His approach from 72 yards out is money, stopping four feet, 11 inches from the cup. He'd make his birdie putt, dropping into a three-way tie for first at three under par. He finished his round at four under and in the lead. You really got to hit every shot is, is tested here. And if you start playing some some indifferent golf, this course can really jump up and bite you. And I, you know, I, I was lucky to get away with a couple of loose ones today. But uh, for the most part, game's on some pretty good form. And um, I do. I, I enjoy this golf course a lot. All right, so Kuchar, Padre Harrington, and MJ Defee are all tied for first at four under par. And how about this? Defee had an eagle on 18 to jump into a tie for first place. The Spurs' regular season is rapidly coming to an end. They have six games to go, all on the road, and it all starts with a three-game West Coast road trip. So the Spurs will play at the Warriors first, followed by the Kings, and then at the Phoenix Suns. They'll come back to Texas after that to play two games at the Moody Center in Austin on April 6th and 8th, which are classified as home games for the Spurs. Then they'll close out their season Sunday to 9th at the Dallas Mavericks. Last night, the Jazz handed the Spurs their fifth straight loss, 128 to 117. San Antonio played without Kelvin Johnson, Devin Vassell, and Jeremy Sohan. That's 51 combined points per game on the bench. Rookie Malachi Branham played, and he led the Spurs at 21. Case at 12 intern Kelly Marsh has more. It was a close one, and the Spurs fought till the end. Rookie Malachi Branham led the Spurs with 21 points and two assists, but missing a couple of their key players, the Spurs just couldn't stop the Jazz. I feel like it was just all about the work, all about the work I put in um, when nobody's watching, and you know, when my opportunity you know, came, you know, I just um, took the most of it and, you know, just, just been playing. Trying to get them to learn how to play is what this is all about. So uh, they're given the effort, you know, they can, we can play better. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm happy with all of their, their efforts. I feel like this team is, you know, very um, close with one another. Um, you know, we, we have each other's back. Um, obviously, it's been a rough year, but we can we continue to try to be there for one another. We continue to compete every single night. It was fan appreciation night, and they were on fire, especially for the final home game at the AT&T Center. Kelly Marsh, Case at 12 Sports. Thank you, Kelly. The Spurs will play at Golden State tomorrow night at 9. And if you missed it last night, this guy with Coach Pop shaved on the back of his head was a hit at the AT&T Center for the Spurs' final home game of the season. Fans there absolutely loved it. And, you know, I'm thinking maybe I should do that with Steve Spreester's mug right here on the back of my head. That's it from the VTO, Spreester. Back to you. VTO, got it. He's already got BTO back there. You guys just can't see it. Yeah. <laughs> you ain't seen nothing yet. Oh, my gosh. We're going to talk Trump and history and political ramifications and what all that means when we come back. As we've been reporting since roughly four o'clock this afternoon, former President Donald Trump has been indicted in a Manhattan courtroom by a prosecutor there for alleged hush money that was paid to someone that he was having an extramarital affair to to hopefully not impact the 2016 presidential election. But Donald Trump is running for president again. So to help us kind of put all this in perspective and what we can see down the line, Dr. David Crockett, he's a professor and chair of political science at Trinity University. David, thank you for joining us on such short notice. Really appreciate it. Uh, had, we talked about the fact that this has never happened before. Has anything even come close to this? Not really. We've had presidents in legal trouble before, but not someone running for the office, obviously impeachment cases and whether that lingers after they leave office. But, you know, in Bill Clinton's case, he settled his uh, issue with Apollo Jones. So this is pretty unprecedented territory. 
So you talk about the, the campaign that he is currently running. There's the question of what does this indictment mean for that campaign, but also I think the question of the ability to campaign. Does the indictment have any impact on his ability con to continue running for office? So it doesn't have any legal impact. He can run for office while he's indicted. He can run for office if he's convicted. He can run for office if he's in jail. But running for office in a primary centered nomination system means showing up at rallies and running campaign, campaign commercials and pressing the flesh. And if he's busy in a courtroom, that's going to be much more difficult to do. So that's going to certainly uh, detract from his normal modus operandi, which is large rallies and, uh, you know, at, and, and uh, his charismatic self uh, with his base. That would be more difficult, I think, to uh, to carry off. But could I make the argument that this may help him in some circles? You can make the argument, and I think there's certainly a strong Trump base that will be further agitated by this. And who knows what he'll say over the course of the next couple of days before he actually has to report for processing. And, uh, you know, this is uncertain territory there. But I think there's a certain faction in the Republican Party electorate that's going to vote for him no matter what. And this will simply... You know, it'll feed the narrative that this is a witch hunt uh, and, it's, and it's driven by partisanship. The real question, though, is are there other elements of the electorate who are looking for something else who might be who might have Trump fatigue or have always been not really fans of Trump? And will there be alternatives and will this move people in that direction? And unlike in 2016, where the 16 alternatives kind of split the vote, maybe the alternatives will be a lot smaller this time, uh, a fewer of them. And something the anti-Trump base will coalesce behind someone. And that might be the case that Haley and DeSantis and others will have to make because they're the ones who, who present the alternative. There's also the fact that this may not be the only time he's indicted over the next six months. Yeah, there are at least three other investigations that I'm aware of involving classified documents in January 6th and then meddling in the Georgia uh, election in, 20, in 2020. And those actually might be much more serious than this one. And if uh, they roll out uh, in sequence, we could have a series of these things over the course of the next few months. And it's one thing to have one indictment on a salacious charge and everyone kind of accepts the kind of person that Trump is. Uh, and But it might be much more of an esoteric argument about where the money is coming from and how they account for it. Uh, but if other indictments come and things that are perceived as more serious, that I think could have end up perhaps having a cascading effect and impact him more negatively. Yeah, but even if, like you said, we see more indictments stack up, he could still very yeah. much be a part of this campaign and on the campaign trail. And as we were watching ABC News special report that was, you know, cutting into part of our five o'clock broadcast, we were hearing some of those correspondents say the Trump campaign wants this. They're ready for this. They have said, bring this on. So looking at, at it from all the different ways that it's unprecedented, hearing a campaign say, yeah, we, we welcome the legal trouble. That in itself sounds unusual. Yeah, it's unusual, but the, he has always been an unusual candidate and an unusual pres president who sort of defies what we think of as conventional wisdom. I would have said in 2016 he wasn't going to win, and I, I was wrong. So I think it's hard to predict, but I think I think what happens in the nomination race may be more predictable depending on how he can mobilize his base, depending on how these indictments come out. And he can use these as sort of the normal polarized narrative of they are attacking me because I am for you. The real bigger question, though, is if he for some reason, despite all this, gets the nomination, um, I don't think that that's going to help him in the general election when there's going to be a significant population that is either always hated him, they're going to vote for Joe Biden, or people who might have voted for a Republican alternative, but they just can't stomach him again. Uh, that, that Trump base, I think, has a ceiling that might be lower than what he's expecting. And he has always been the one to sort of play to his base, not recognizing that he needs to get more than that to win. And he kind of eked over the finish line in 2016 with that. He was not able to do it in 2020. And I'm not sure how much I see that uh, working in 2024 without a different uh, 
method of doing business. And for lack of a better word, uh, Professor, are there going to be tea leaves that you're going to be watching now? Like there have been some candidates out there who have informally announced, who seem to be in sort of a holding pattern. One of them mentioned is Texas' own governor, Greg Abbott. People said if he gets yeah. in, that may indicate that, that people think Trump is in trouble. Are those the kind of tea leaves that we should be watching over the next few months? Yeah, perhaps. So you, you do have some candidates who will get in or have gotten in who aren't too worried about Trump because they're intending to run contrary to Trump like Haley and DeSantis. There are other people, I think, who are waiting to see what happens and they won't get in if Trump's going to stay a strong candidate. But if he looks weak, they would see this as their opportunity. And if those start jumping in, that might be a signal that uh, at least they believe that uh, he's not going to be able to seal the deal. On the other hand, if too many of them get in, you will have a rerun of what happened in 2016 with 17 candidates. And candidates win when they can coalesce the establishment and the money behind them. And if that money and that support is split 10, or 10 different directions, the net Trump base might only be 35 percent. But that's enough to win a primary and that's enough to get the nomination. One thing's for sure, there's plenty of watt to watch in the weeks and the months to come. Dr. David Crockett, thanks so much for being here, professor and chair of political science of Trinity University. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you for your time. We'll be right back. In your 60-second recap today, former President Donald Trump has been indicted by a New York grand jury. The charges involve alleged hush money payments made during the 2016 presidential campaign. He is now the first ex-president charged with a crime. A man involved in a deadly shooting at a bar on the northwest side turned himself in. It happened about 2 this morning on Consul Drive. He allegedly shot the victim during an argument. The name of the victim and the suspect have not been released. Police investigating a shooting north of downtown today. Officers say two men were at a house when one accused the other of sleeping with his girlfriend. One of them pulled a gun out and shot the other in the leg. No word if anyone is in custody. A military helicopter crash in Kentucky kills nine people happened at Fort Campbell last night. Officials say two Black Hawk helicopters crashed during a training mission and aircraft safety team investigating. You can find these stories and more on KSAT.com. And that's your 60 second wrap up. Let's take a look outside with live cam. We got some thicker clouds on one side here. A little bit of clearing, but it's just been gray all day, Adam. Yeah, it has. Very gray day, and we had the very poor visibility, which caused some issues on the roadways this morning. I do expect more fog and drizzle to develop again later tonight and for early tomorrow. But right now, we just have the clouds the off chance of a stray sprinkle, but otherwise it's just going to be that typical morning dampness again tomorrow. 77 currently by nine o'clock will be 74 tomorrow morning, 68. So not cooling down all that much. We do have some changes to talk about as we head into the weekend, some noticeable changes in the record challenging warmth in just a bit. All right, as Myra aptly put it, it was soupy out there earlier today, but you know what? I, it's Thermometer Thursday. That's right. And if I caught a glimpse of a picture, I think I oh, saw. Wait. There you go. Oh, it wait. is a throwback. Wait. Oh, you gave up the surprise. Well, we didn't say what. Okay, you're right. Trust me. The throwback People thermometer Thursday. That's true. That's yeah, true. You're going to want to stay tuned for this. We have a thermometer <laughs> Thermomiversary. <laughs> I do what I'm so excited. I like it. I love the thermomiversary. Okay, you're going to want to see this. Uh, Let's take a look at our radar because we don't have any activity out there right now, but we did earlier today. Yeah, we had a few sprinkles just over the past hour east of town, but not much to speak of. This is our 12 hour rainfall and the streaky nature of some of those sprinkles and very light showers that developed earlier today. And you look at the radar estimates on the order of maybe 15 hundredths of an inch at the airport. Officially, we did get just over a tenth of an inch with 11 hundredths measured at the airport. A few of those streaky showers just clipped San Antonio International. So at least we got something out of it. Not enough to pull us out of our drought or even put a dent in it, but better than nothing. We'll take it. Hey, it beats a day of full sunshine and heat that just dries out the ground even more. I guess we could think of it that way. Uh, big picture across the state. We've got this upper level flow coming off the Pacific with it. Plenty of upper level clouds, that moisture aloft, and then of course the humid flow off the Gulf here at the ground. And then off to the west, we still have this big dip in the upper level flow. That, that's the storm system that came onshore 
that I was showing you the past couple of days moving into California. Now it's providing the snow in the Rockies and the higher elevations and even some desert rains. At the ground, this is the cold front associated with it. And this cold front is going to be moving through our neck of the woods late in the day tomorrow. Tomorrow evening, it's going to be a very slow frontal passage and it's not going to have immediate noticeable impacts. Not one of those fronts. It's coming in from the Pacific. This is not a strong front barreling down the plains. Those are the ones that you feel right away. This is not that, but it will drop the humidity a bit. It's that's by tomorrow evening. Right now it's humid and tonight it's going to be sticky and muggy. Low clouds dominating the sky and with those low clouds, some fog, some drizzle and even a few sprinkles from time to time and very light showers, a few hundredths of an inch here and there. But the difference tomorrow is that it's not going to last as long. It's not going to be as stubborn. It's not going to be as prolonged and actually I think we'll break out into sunshine by about the noon hour tomorrow and have a very sunny afternoon and it's going to be warmer as well. Speaking of drought, this is the newest drought monitor. I don't like what I see. This extreme and exceptional drought area around San Antonio has been expanded a little bit. And it's really the worst concentration of drought across the state. No problems. East Texas, parts of North Texas, no problems. Panhandle eh, still looking pretty, pretty dry. They could use the moisture. Our rain chances 20% tomorrow for just some of those very light showers, 20% Sunday for some afternoon storms. And then Wednesday and Thursday of next week, right now we'll have another cold front drop in a week one. And right now we've got a 20% chance of some showers and storms. But here's the difference. This gives us the potential of higher rain chances and the potential for better coverage of that rain. We're talking dew points in the 60s near 70 now. Tomorrow as that front arrives tomorrow evening, Feeling pleasant. Those dew points really fall off down into the 40s by tomorrow night and low humidity through just Saturday this weekend. Temperature wise across the state, 70s for all of us. 68 tomorrow morning with that dampness, then by the afternoon sunny and 90 degrees. The wind shifting out of the west. That means 95 in Catula, 90 in Del Rio, Carrizo Springs, a high of 93. Elmendorf, La Soya, a high temperature of 91. 58 Saturday morning with the lower humidity, 85 for the afternoon high temperature, both Saturday and Sunday, and then record challenging warmth as we get into next week. Tuesday, we're talking 95. That would be a record by two degrees. Oh, it's the thermomiversary. Once a year we get to do this. You know, the way I see it, Myra gives us the fiesta hair periodically, <laughs> right? <laughs> Once or yes. twice a year, yes. So I can give you college caskey. Please my, do. My very first thermometer that I ever made was in <laughs> March of the year 2000. This is my thermomiversary. The very first thermometer. I still have it. I, I'll bring it in some other time. <laughs> and that's the picture Ron Reinhardt took of me with my very first thermometer, Dr. Reinhardt. Uh, he was the one who taught me the initial process on how to make these thermometers because for meteorological instrumentation class, that's what we had to do. What better way to appreciate and understand calibration, range, resolution, and so many more elements of instrumentation. So we did it, and of course, it sparked a big interest in me, and from then on, I just wanted to make more thermometers. So this is my thermomiversary. It's been, what, 23 years now. There's a big gap in there where I didn't have the time or the uh, space and resources to make them, but either way, I mentioned the, uh, <clears throat> College Caskey, Myra, this one's for you. Ooh, let me see. Yeah. I haven't aged a day. Yes, look at those curls. Yeah, yeah baby. Yeah. Oh, back in my prime. Was, you, yep. Didn't you star in Charles in Charge? <laughs> a lot of people said, <laughs> no, you know, actually a lot of people said I was the bad guy from Ghost. Yeah, oh, like, like, right, could, remember greatest American it. hero, the guy who couldn't fly. You kind of look like that guy too a little bit. Oh God, if I only could get some of that hair back, huh? <laughs> oh, Martha J. Garcia of San Antonio, winner of a homemade thermometer. Go to ksat.com slash thermometer to enter the drawing. Martha, I sent you the uh, email about 30 minutes ago. And happy thermomiversary. Happy yeah. thermomiversary you. to you, Caskey. Myers Throwback Caskey. Little, little baby Caskey with the wings. Yeah. The hat. <laughs> so cute. Little baby. <laughs> A casky pup. <laughs> we'll be right back. A thermo pup. <laughs> To the buzz and goodbye short round cans, hello tall skinny ones. More beverage companies now using slimmer cans meant to signal to consumers that these new drinks 
are healthier than beer and sodas in the old round cans. Hmm. Analysts say consumers see slim cans as more sophisticated. I see it a problem is for my koozie collection. Yeah. Now what are we going to do? Got to get Tra skinny koozie. Traditionally, beverage companies opted for the 12-ounce stout can to allow more room to advertise the contents of the drink. But with these slimmer versions, brands can squeeze more cans on store shelves. Hmm. So there's that. Thinking about an electric car, but you're just not sure? Well, that's where plug-in hybrids come in. They offer the best of both worlds and... Lamborghini has you covered. Meet Revuelto. Lamborghini's newly unveiled sports car has three electric motors and a V12 gasoline engine. It's a good looking car. The Italian manufacturer says the Revuelto can produce <laughs> 1,000 horsepower. As for why it's a plug in hybrid, not fully electric, Lamborghini says the batteries are a full EV, would require to keep the same performance, and that would make it too heavy. No price point has been revealed, but chances are it's very expensive. You know, I have a car just like that. It's about this. Big. I was going to say, you're, it's, it's you're, a Hot Wheels your version. son has a Hot Wheels Lamborghini. <laughs> He's got good taste. Yeah. yeah. Be right back. Lucky. All right, looking ahead back to 90 degrees tomorrow after a damp morning. We'll have a sunny afternoon and then Saturday. A lot of sunshine, lower humidity, mid 80s, mid 80s all weekend, really. Thanks for watching the News at 6. See you back here on the Night Beat at 10.